Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be addressing drugs, delinquency, and special juvenile offender populations. However, again, in order to go into this chapter, we need to take a much broader approach to what leads down the path towards juvenile delinquency. Again, we can consider all the sociological variables like growing up in poverty, being male, age, the culture you're exposed to, the peers that you're exposed to, uh, the family, whether your siblings are involved, whether your parents are involved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But again, it's much more complex than that also, because we have to put ourselves in the psychological mindset of people that are engaging in these types of behaviors that society labels deviant. And we have to ask ourselves, what is going on in their head? Why are they making these decisions? Is it a question of morality, not knowing right and wrong? Is it a question of desperation, like strain theory? They just have no other options. Is it just because that's their cultural way of life? That's what's normal. What leads down these paths? When it comes to somebody taking drugs, for example, First, you have to be exposed to drugs. What kind of a situation do you have to be in to find yourself to where you're exposed to drugs? And then what's going on in the person's head while they're weighing the risks? For one, we have to think about biological factors and that juveniles, again, as we've discussed previously, their prefrontal cortex doesn't even fully develop till they're 25 years old. What kind of good decisions are they making? And then you could look at things like education. Are they not aware? that you know, if you just go to school and get a college degree, you'll make a lot more money than you ever will if you sell drugs. They feel like they don't have a chance. How much of like their school engagement and whether they're buying in and whether they're succeeding is involved? Have they experienced trauma in their life? Again, there are just so many questions we have to ask, but the book is not exceptionally thorough. But again, I think this is here where the qualitative research can really come in handy. Yes, we have statistics about drug use, and yes, it's going down, but yes, we still have problems. And people in poverty, those who are exposed to trauma, et cetera, are more likely to engage in these types of things. But through qualitative research, we can go out and ask these people, what's going on in your life? What led down these road? Why did you make these decisions? Are you glad you made these decisions? Was it enjoyable? Would you have preferred to make different decisions? What could have helped improve your outcomes? What can make your situation better? How can we help you in the future? You know, delving deep into these people's experiences can be very, very beneficial. And so again, the book doesn't do it justice, delving into the lived experiences of people in these situations who may be engaging in juvenile behavior or doing drug use and abuse and things along those lines. So again, that's just a quick disclaimer to get us introduced. Um, but the book for our learning objectives this week, we're going to be looking at adolescent drug use along with different types of criminal offenses. Um, we're going to be looking at violent off offenders. We're going to look at the association between mental illness and juvenile delinquency. And then we're also going to be delving into homelessness. Um, your book just opens up, though, talking about the types of offenders that tend to be arrested. Um, we're really focusing on this chapter on the drug offenses and some of the violent crimes, but we have drug offenders and then special offense youth uh, also include youthful offenders that have substance abuse histories, juvenile sex offenders, juvenile gang youth, and youthful violent offenders. Special needs uh, by your book is going to include young people with chronic mental health issues, and then we're going to look at special populations and young people uh, and this category include crossover youth and homeless youth that we'll delve into a little bit here. Uh, but to begin, drug use among adolescents. Again, whatever you might be hearing and whatever you might guess, drug use has drastically gone down over the last several decades. If you look at crime statistics and drug statistics and gang statistics, etc., it goes up from the 1960s to the 1990s. And then about 1997, when we all start to get phones and technology, etc., all of these things go down. So since the late 90s and early 2000s, you've seen dramatic decreases in overall crime, drug use, etc., across the board. So like lately you hear all the politicians talking about crime, yada, 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 and then they always are talking about crime in urban areas. Again, the murder rate is higher in places in Louisiana than it is in, than it is in like New York City. 
So again, even the trends have changed from the inner cities to even more like rural and suburban places. And so things to think about there. But in general, drug use has gone down. Again, since the 70s, it has decreased dramatically to the present. However, these high-risk youth, okay, the ones that are engaging in this culture, you're finding much more substantial increased use with a varying amount of drugs. And you're seeing, you know, delving into that culture of drug dealing, trafficking, and all the other things that can come along with it too. So what you're finding is, even though less people are doing drugs, those that are involved that are juveniles, these high-risk youth especially, are getting a little bit deeper into the game, meaning that there are more juveniles involved in selling drugs. So maybe back in the day it was an adult game, but now you're starting to see that youth have exposure to these things and they do get involved in that. A little bit later we'll talk about schools and things, but you know. Um, we do need to understand the use versus abuse uh, kind of difference. So again, there's just general use and then there's the one you get the dependency or it starts to cause dysfunction in your life. So we need to make a disparity between those. Um, but again, alcohol use still tends to be the most uh, drug of choice for adolescents and why? You know, what are they exposed to first? What tends to be on the shelves at their parents' houses, you know? So the charts over here on the right, it looks at um, illicit drug use uh, ages 12 to 17 by male and female and by race. Um, and so you can see that males and females are generally using about the same amount according to these statistics, which is incredibly surprising. But I'd like to look at type of drug there. Um, and then you can see the Hispanics, more than whites, more than blacks, more than Asians, and then two or more races, a little bit above Asians. Um, in the bottom right, we have estimated number of past users of illicit drugs and all the types they're using. Again, marijuana, pain relievers, tranquilizers, hallucinogens, cocaine, stimulant, inhalants, methamphetamine, heroin. Teenagers have access to all of these types of things. You know, but again, how do they get access to this? What kind of culture are they being exposed to? Is it people that are, you know, in poverty? Is it people in the middle class? Is it the upper class? Or is it across the board? And again, yes, you're going to see correlations with things like socioeconomic status and race and gender historically, which is why I'm just looking at this chart. Like, that's a little bit surprising. It says females more than males on using drugs and i have some questions about that that makes me wonder if their survey was accurate and whether the males were lying and the females were telling the truth or if that's just stereotypical for me to have some bias and assuming something like that but from what i always see like if you look at drug use and like marijuana use for example males use that much more than females but then when you look at things like cocaine and heroin it balances out between males and females but generally males tend to do a little bit more but with the use it's showing that females are a little bit more so now, as I'm giving this lecture, of course, with being a scientist and a researcher, now I need to delve deeper into these statistics, and I'm going to have to come back to you. However, going back and editing this segment will be impossible. But I do love that when you're learning, new doors always open, and now I have to look at that, because for adults, it's not like that. But for juveniles, it is. I'm almost tempted to escape out of this and start doing the research, but that'll drive you all crazy. But I could show you how it's done <laughs> for another day. I already made videos on that. Okay. But do know that, again, drug use is going down, but those who are using drugs and getting involved in the gang and people that are more high at risk tend to be using more and are getting involved in drug trafficking. Uh, so drug use and delinquency, again, Drug, alcohol tends to be that gateway drug, if that is even a true thing. You always hear that stereotype about marijuana being a gateway drug, etc. But again, it's alcohol that people tend to have the most access to. So alcohol use tends to follow a pattern of minor delinquency and exposure to friends and parents who drink, which then further leads them down the rabbit hole and exposes them. Again, the use of marijuana follows participation in alcohol and minor delinquency and adoption of beliefs and values that are consistent with those held by peers but opposed by parent standards because marijuana tends to deviate from social norms but alcohol doesn't. Adolescent drug use proceeds to other illicit drugs if relationships with parents are poor and there's an increased exposure to peers who use a variety of illegal drugs. That's not causation, again, that's just a correlation between relationships with parents, the home life, what they're getting exposed to, the types of people that they're surrounded by, whether it's the peers or people at their school or 
people in their family, whatever it might be, that are exposing them to these variety of illegal drugs and exposing them to that way of life. Again, how do you get caught up in this way of life to where you're committing crimes and drinking and doing drugs and not doing well in school? What leads down that path? That's pretty much what this whole class is about introducing, okay? Early factors consistent with perinatal difficulties, minor physical abnormalities and brain damage and later development or risk factors are found in the family environment, including a family history of alcoholism, poor family management practices and family conflict. Other risk factors are associated with antisocial behavior and academic failure. But again, you're asking, what's going on early on? Is it issues at home? Is it issues in the school? Is it problems with their peers? Is it problems with their self? Is it physical issues? Something's going on. Is it the chemistry of the brain? Is it just their cognitions and their way they're thinking? Is it lack of coping skills? Have they ex been exposed to trauma? Again, this whole lecture, I'm just listing out all these different things that we need to consider when we're accounting for group <clears throat> rates or frequencies of engaging in this type of behavior or on an individual level. So we can go on what's going on in that person's mind. Why are they doing these kinds of things? So again, these community level risk factors include living in economically depraved areas, Disorganized neighborhoods, again, living in that culture of poverty, which increases the exposure to crime and drugs. Youths who have hard drugs are more likely to engage in chronic delinquent behavior also. And then again, juveniles getting in trafficking and drug dealing is an increase because they're getting exposure to that world and they're gaining access. What are we as a society to do about it? <clears throat> Your book gets a little bit deep into all of these types of things, but again, we got to take that biopsychosocial approach. What's going on with the teenage body? What's going on with the actual physical teenage brain that's influencing their decisions? Then we got to be thinking about their cognitions, their emotional levels, their motivations. And then we got to think about like individual engagement with school, their personal relationships, their individual experiences in the social context. Then we have to think about all those variables in the social context and address them. So again, through biological problems and neurochemistry problems, if it comes to a point where you need medicine and things like that, there are solutions for that. Psychological problems could be learning how to cope with your problems, dealing with psychologists, having more positive interactions with your peers, learning skills, learning self-esteem, learning self-competency, all of these kinds of things. And then you have your social or community level or federal level or state level programs or whatever it might be, such as these prevention programs. Like, does education reduce drug abuse and, uh, you know, addiction and alcoholism and all of these things? You can see a correlation with that. Does increasing socioeconomic status reduce a lot of the problems associated with crime? Yes. Help somebody get some skills, get them an education, help them get a job, that tends to solve a lot of problems. Drug court problems or drug court is a solution for nonviolent criminals. Nonviolent criminals might be engaging in petty theft like stealing things from Walmart just to feed their heroin addiction. Is prison the correct answer? Is there an alternative solution? Do they need some help to get their life back on track, to get their brain in the way that they feel more stable and can actually function in society without being dysfunctional? Looking at substance abuse prevention programs and helping out, um, looking at treatment interventions, looking at restorative justice. You know, how can I teach this person positive skills instead of just punishing them? Because punishment doesn't teach them good skills. All it's doing is stopping some form of behavior. Should we look at strict enforcement, having harsher penalties? But again, we've tried the harsher penalties and that doesn't even seem to has no effect as a deterrent. Um, harm reduction or even recidivism. How do we stop people from repeating and coming back again and again and again? Juvenile sex offenders is a little bit of a dark subject that starts to get opened up. We can look at this subject from perpetrators or we can look at it from victims' perspectives. Adolescents who have been convicted of being sex offenders are more likely to have offended someone their own age or younger, but there are cases of adults being sexually abused by adolescents who are 16 or 17. 40 to 70 percent of sex offenders have been sexually abused themselves. So always that correlation. And 80 percent of those victimizations occurred when they were children. So again, they're learning 
very bad behavior. One third of sexual offenses against children are committed by teenagers, which I was absolutely shocked to find out. I did not guess that. That's a lot. One third of all sexual offenses are committed by teenagers. Juvenile sex offender characteristics. Again, these are these patterns or predictability or variables associated with it, okay? Having a history of severe family problems, being separated from parents, being placed away from home, having been a victim of sexual, emotional, or physical abuse themselves, trouble um, with social skills or social interactions, academic and behavioral problems, including ADHD uh, and learning disabilities, poor peer relations, social isolation, poor impulse control, lower than average IQ, and psychopathology, meaning what's going on in their brain versus chemistry and also cognitions. Again, hopefully you can see that there are just so many variables we need to account for when we're looking at juvenile delinquency. But that's the beauty of sociology, right? We're looking at the big picture and asking, okay, what are all of these things that we need to think about to make sense of reality and how things are working, okay? There are twice as many female victims as male victims. Um, females, 70%, but when the victim was a younger child, then males, uh, victims outnumbered females which means if you look at age earlier, children, males are more likely, but then there's a flip to where it becomes more likely to be females, okay? Uh, violent offenders. <clears throat> Juvenile violence has absolutely gone down. However, your book does introduce things that kids will engage in. Remember, humans are capable of a variety of things, incredibly nice things, but awful, awful things also, honestly, okay? Juvenile violence has gone down, however, Killing parents was mentioned in your book. School shooters, chronic offenders, engaging in assault and other forms of violence, those that engage in sexual violence, etc. Again, just use your imagination. Think about all the things that kids get into. Think about exposure to violence. Think about just fights between friends that get physical or brawls in school that get physical or the kid who's 15 years old and some kid robs him for a bag of weed and he shoots him. That happened like two years ago, close to where I'm at now. Like not, I'm in, you know, the city, but it was like in a rural town. But like a 15-year-old kid, some guy like robbed him and he just like shot the kid. Oh, 15. And you're like, okay, he's 15. What's going on in that kid's brain? Is that kid's brain even fully developed to be able to make decisions? Are they making conscious decisions? Can we hold them accountable for murder when they shoot someone at 15? Again, opening up Pandora's box of where are juveniles at developmentally? What's going on in their head? What are their experiences? And then how can we relate to them and get on their level to help them get through life without making decisions that might cost them in the end? Special needs and youthful offenders, you're gonna see another huge association again with the psychological factors related to juvenile delinquency. Again, these mentally ill juveniles or emotionally disturbed delinquents. 65% of use in the juvenile system have a diagnosable psychiatric or substance abuse disorder. And 75% of respondents with one disorder meet diagnostic criteria for two or more disorders. 65% of all youth exposed to the system have something going on that can be diagnosed. And 75% of those that are diagnosed are likely to have more than one thing going on. Okay. So again, is it social factors like poverty, the education system, going to a crappy school, being exposed to a culture of drugs and violence? Is it trauma in the social context? But then again, how does that kind of stuff also affect what's going on in your brain? You know, and is trauma in the social context, for example, associated with psychological disorders? And the answer is absolutely yes. So again, hopefully you can kind of see the cyclical pattern. What, ex what happens in the environment affects our brain and our body. And how our body is functioning affects the decisions we're making and how we act in the social context. Again, that cyclical biopsychosocial approach or psychosocial psychobio approach, direct, depending on the direction you're going, right? Or from psychology to sociology, so, you know, social psychology or biopsychology, or there's biosociology. You have all of these different categories. These are all actual theories in social sciences, just blending the fields, blending of perspectives to be able to account for phenomena. One in five juveniles uh, of that we've been discussing suffer severely from a mental illness to the point where they are unable to function as a young adult and unable to become a responsible adult. Again, 
There are a lot of things that predict our overall outcomes, like our parents' socioeconomic status, the type of school that we go to, you know, like our personal motivations and drives and individual personality factors are also associated with it, okay? But again, this can lead across the lifespan, okay? We struggle as a kid that can affect us throughout our entire life. How do we set society up in a way where everybody has a chance to thrive? And again, that's the overarching goal, right? Um, we do see that we have mental health screening and assessment and detention facilities. But again, how efficient is the bureaucracy at dealing with stuff? Yes, the courts are good at getting people in and getting people out. The prisons or the jails are good at holding people in there, etc. We do have access to counselors and medication in these systems and dentists and doctors and other things. But do you honestly think all of the needs are actually being met by the interned population of juveniles in America? Again, we need to ask that question. How can we better treat mental illness, problems with poverty, lack of skills due to lack of education, to create more functional juveniles and adults? Again, these are the overall questions. Homeless use is a significant problem. Again, you'll see high rates of homeless youth for people that struggle with their home lives, people that tend to be LGBTQIA that get kicked out of their house, for example. Um, these are people defined as those that lack a regular nighttime residence, residents defined as not a, a place that is just not for sleeping. This includes cars, parks, public spaces, migratory children and can be are included in this also. Being homeless exposes you to becoming a victim because it exposes you to that dark culture of humanity, okay? Youthful offenders are more likely to experience homelessness disproportionately. Again, the young and the old are always at more at risk of poverty, homelessness, um, malnutrition, all of these things. Every year, approximately 30,000 youth-aged kids, uh, kids, uh, they go over 18 so they can no longer be in foster care and 20 to 25,000 of them age out of the juvenile justice system. So most have limited options for housing, income, family, and other social support. Again, the American bureaucracy is great and all, but people fall through the cracks. There's massive forms of inequality, okay? Some kids get great upbringings in really nice towns and other kids get exposed to violence on a daily basis or they're having to walk over dead people. Like my sister's a social worker in Nashville and the kids that they treat, I mean, they literally walk over people that OD'd in the middle of the night and are dead on their way to school in the morning. So again, not every kid has it all bright and shiny. So again, we need to be thinking about all the factors that leads kids to using drugs, <clears throat> engaging in crime. And then as a society, what can we do to help parents to make it better for them so they're not beating their kids? What can we help their parents' mental illness to help their kids be better, etc.? I mean, there's just so many options. I right, wish you all the best, and thank you so much for listening.